In this video I'm going to talk about big data and some other big ideas and jargon that you might come across as a data journalist including open data and linked data, um, related terminology that you're likely to come across and some of the ethical and statistical issues that some of these concepts raise. So let's start with open data and it's worth going back to 2009 to talk about this and particularly a TED talk that was given by Tim Berners-Lee. You'll find the full talk in the slides on Moodle um, and there's a particular point for various different countries. There's a particular point in this video where Tim Berners-Lee gets the video, uh, gets the audience to shout um, raw data now or open data now and it was part of a general movement around the time to try to get governments to be more transparent and it worked. Um, in the US, uh, one of the earliest adopters of open data was the US government in launching the data.gov portal. In the UK, shortly after that, data.gov.uk was launched and many other countries followed as well. In fact, not just countries, but cities and regions also launched open data portals. London, Birmingham, Ontario and various other cities, for example, had particular places, websites where you could get hold of open data. And the idea was, was that this would, among other things, stimulate economic growth. One of the problems, though, was that the term open data was bandied about quite freely and um, people often meant different things by it. So a number of people tried to pin down what exactly we mean by open data. At opendefinition.org you'll find this sentence which can be broken down into three different parts. The idea that open data should be freely accessible to use, modify and share. That you should be able to do this for any purpose so there's no restriction on what you might use that data for. And finally that there might be some requirements around provenance. So in other words you must say where it's from. Uh, there's an obvious reason for that in that people should be able to trace the origin of the data and that you should be open yourself as well so you shouldn't be necessarily making money out of the data or at least making it closed when it was made open in the first place. And this sometimes throws up situations like this. This was me talking about what I thought was open data being shared by the Associated Press and the LA Times and New York Times on coronavirus. But Owen Boswava, who's a particular expert in this field, um, pointed out that the, a couple of the data sets were licensed for non-commercial use only and that the um, third data set was licensed from a source largely from a source which was again only provided for educational and academic research purposes. So again you could argue that this wasn't open data because you could only use it in a non-commercial sense. Another key dimension here is the idea of being machine readable, that open data is only open if it can be read by computers as well as people. Earlier this year, for example, in Watt tweeted about the frustrations that he was having with Scotland's data on coronavirus as well, and the fact that he was having to scrape that data, scrape the pages where they were releasing information in order to make it accessible. And in one part of his post, he describes just how often they changed the structure of the page, but, and so he had to keep rewriting his scraper to make that data open. David Eaves, in his Three Laws of Open Government Data, also um, makes an attempt to outline what makes data open in a nicely succinct fashion. The first part he mentions is that it needs to be findable, um, so if it's not spidered or indexed, then it's not open data. Likewise, this idea of machine readable, this being in a format which can be read by computers. And finally, the legal basis for openness. If it can't be repurposed um, legally, then again, this not, is not open data. This, um, this issue comes up sometimes in discussions you might have with sources or with readers. In this um, particular Twitter thread, for example, um, at the BBC Shared Data Unit, we'd done a story on the availability of charging points for electric cars. Now, there's no official data about this. There's a number of data sources and 
in the process of doing this story, um, we approached one organization for their data. It's Tom Callow. Tom um, said that we couldn't have access to the data, which is fair enough, so we used a different data source. And then he criticised the story for using what he felt was the wrong data. In the process of this, he had a discussion about not wanting every Tom, Dick or Harry to be able to access the data, but at the same time maintained that his data was open. We maintain a live map. We show exactly what charging points there are and when they're being used. Of course, this isn't the definition of open data that most people would understand, and you can see by my response that basically he wasn't correct in that response. A live map is not open data. It's not machine readable. It's not necessarily accessible and so on. Now, the rise of open data has had a number of impacts on journalism as a profession. Um, in one piece of research, uh, there's an argument that it has turned journalists at times into activists fighting for the right to access public data. You might have seen similar sorts of developments around freedom of information laws as well. But beyond the legal dimension, you also have a development of a culture around transparency and advocating for more transparency um, and more accountability around, those, uh, around areas like open data. In this video, which again you can watch in the slides from Ellen Miller, um, we see a reaction to some of the drawbacks of this open data movement. This was about a year or two after the launch of data.gov in the US and uh, Ellen's organisation was responsible for essentially holding the government to account in terms of their use of this data. And what they highlighted was that um, what the government chooses Choose to, chose to make open, I should say, was um, not necessarily what journalists would want to ask questions about. The directive is only as strong as its enforcement. To be sure, there have been some meaningful first steps from agencies and the White House, certainly HHS. So it's, it's worth watching that anyway in terms of um, what was deemed uh, newsworthy. Essentially, we shouldn't be relying on uh, public bodies to solve our journalistic problems. And indeed, um, it's not necessarily only going to be public bodies that have newsworthy data. The, the very existence of open data and its skew towards public sources might uh, shape our reporting in ways that we should certainly, at the very least, reflect on critically in, in terms of whether we should be looking for harder to find data. By way of example, these are the data sets that were published on some of the UK government's open data um, portals. Um, and again, you can see that there's, you know, obviously this is not an even split. Different areas have more data available than others. Lesage and Hackett, in their research in 2014, go as far as to argue that while the, the, the you know, working with data promises to challenge the regime, by using open data, we in some ways deepen the regime's epistemological stance. So in other words, we're essentially accepting um, the uh, definitions and methods of those in power when it comes to collecting information. So if you think of the idea that public bodies decide what data to collect, how to collect it, and what to make open, we we're outsourcing our own decisions on those questions to that organisation. Nicholas Kaiser Brill um, writes a, a wonderful talk on this subject around statistics and the idea of how the word statistics, for example, comes from the word state because it was the state that collected this information. And he gives an example of, of the collection of data in Sweden in the 19th century, uh, in the 18th century. Um, and how certain people were not included in this collection of data because essentially those in power were not interested in those types of people. It's well worth reading his article in full for a, a really insightful history on some of these issues. And you'll see some of the data journalism that's done around this starting to either question official statistics or hold the data itself to account. 
in this story, a colleague of mine, Daniel Wainwright, decided to tackle the issue of homelessness data, which is notoriously unreliable. The, the methodology is um, so mixed that I think the official statistics body actually um, kind of raised the alarm that this was not reliable data. What Daniel wanted to do was find some sort, sort of more reliable measure of homelessness, so he used freedom of information requests to ask individual councils for a different measure of homelessness to the one that was used nationally, more to do with how many people were accessing homelessness services. And he found a much more um, useful figure that was not necessarily open. Likewise, the LA Times used machine learning techniques to look at the um, reliability of crime data in their city. And in my 10 principles of data journalism, one of the uh, principles that I identify is that the impartiality of data journalism or journalism more generally means not relying only on stories where data exists and is easy to obtain. Sometimes as journalists, we might launch open data projects or projects which are um, around the collection and uh, making available data which has a public interest. This is a project by a former student on the course, uh, Barbara Maceda, who um, sets out to open up data in Cuba. Likewise, the Our Oil Money project seeks to open up data on the revenue from uh, oil in Ghana. And ProPublica um, created an open data project around priests accused of sexual abuse. And it, that's well worth exploring if you're considering a similar project, particularly around the decisions, the editorial decisions that they've made around whether they make changes to that database and how they um, deal with problems with the data, which is based on data obtained from elsewhere. Kinsler makes the point about the difference between available data and accessible data and the way that information is altered by the way in which it's been published. So, for example, it opens up the possibility for error. And again, this is something that ProPublica deal with in the way that they make their information available. So when doing an open data project, you might consider that difference in um, between something being accessible and something being available and easy to find. And Philip Hammond and his work on um, journalism and big data, which I think is for recommended reading this week, talks about the shift from journalistic culture, within journalistic culture, from the idea of objectivity as a norm towards transparency. So we're now getting projects where the aim of journalism is not necessarily to tell an objective truth, but to create transparency around data which may not necessarily reflect that objective truth. It may be flawed in a number of ways, but it's a step towards understanding or um, scrutiny. I now then want to move on to a second um, phrase that you will hear talked about in regard to data and this uh, if you like chronologically followed the development of open data in around 2009-2010 and that was the development of linked data in the years that followed and in fact in that Tim Berners-Lee talk you'll see him talk about linked data as well. Linked data is basically data that encodes relationships um, in a way that computers can understand. A good example of this would be you have some data that says that there is an entity called Bob and that he works in a place called York. Now that um, York part of the data would be linked to another data set of cities, for example, and in that data set it says that York is part of a country called the UK. So we've got two different data sets here. Um, and in those data sets, we've got these three parts of data, what you might call a triple. This is often called a triple. So two entities and a relationship between them. And the relationship itself is a piece of data. Now, what's interesting about linked data is that these two data sets can then be used by a computer to generate a new piece of information, which is that Bob works in the UK. 
in this particular example. So neither data set in isolation says that Bob works in the UK. What's happened here is that that um, link, York, is used to make a logical jump, a logical conclusion. The computer knows that York is in the UK, therefore it knows that Bob it works in the UK. And that's fundamentally what linked data is about. Data that's uh, linked in a series of ways that allows computers to make those judgments. And I'll show you some examples of those judgments being made that you'll actually be familiar with in a minute. First of all, if you do want to find out more about linked data, there's a video in the slides as well that explains it in a bit more detail. But I want to move on to another piece of jargon related to linked data, which is the idea of an ontology. An ontology is a way of describing the concepts that are used in your linked data. So typically we've got types of entities and relationships between them. In this example, we've got an ontology around um, animals. So the animals are one entity. They have um, a kind of a class, so they're, they're a subclass of something else. They have a geographical range property and they have a typical habitat property as well. The BBC and other organisations have uh, quite often have ontologies to describe their own data, uh, their own linked data, and the relationships between the different entities in that. So, for example, it's um, probably clearer to show you the sports ontology of the BBC. And you can see here, for example, we have, um, for example, an event um, entity. Now, an event has a time, and that time has a start and an end time. And it has a program. Um, the, the Olympics itself, the Olympics 2012, is part of the Summer Olympics. Um, within the 2012 Olympics, you have the men's sprint. Within that, you have the semi-finals. Within that, you have heat one and so on. So these are lots of different entities in this ontology, in this um, set of data, essentially, and how they relate to each other. So if, for example, you know that a particular person um, belongs to the sport of cycling, then you know that they are taking part in this particular event, for example, at this particular Olympics. The BBC also has a story uh, lines ontology, which um, it's created with other news organisations, uh, which you can see there as well. And uh, a lot of this ontology finds its way into what's called micro data. So this is part of the HTML uh, around news articles, particularly in areas like sports and finance and weather, which are very structured areas. Um, and this markup helps search engines like Google understand the content in a linked way. And again, we'll see the results of this in a minute. Now, I mentioned this idea of triples. So a triple, remember, is that um, series of three pieces of information. Two of them are entities and one's a relationship between them, like Bob and um, York and works for as the relationship between those two entities. Now a database of triples is called a triple store, so that's another type of jargon you might come across. And if you see a, a format, a file format of RDF, that is the format that's often used for triples. It stands for Resource Description Framework, but that basically means that it's likely to be linked data if it ends in .RDF. And likewise, if you come across Sparkle, SparkQL, then that's a language that's used for querying um, RDF and, or, or, or um, linked data. So again, that's a clue that you're dealing with linked data. And then a the final piece of jargon when it comes to linked data is the idea of a URI. A URI, very similar to a URL, in fact, it, it is pretty much the same thing in many ways, is a unique URL that is used to um, store data about a thing or a relationship. So for example, in our example of Bob lives in um, York, or, or um, Bob works for Shell, for example, we might have a unique URI for Bob, which is something like person.com slash Bob or wikipedia.org slash Bob. Then we have a unique URI for the relationship. So um, for lives in, that would be schema.org slash residence. Schema.org is a website that is used for uh, a lot of relationships in linked data. 
So it also has works for if he was working for a company like Shell. And again, Shell in that situation would have a unique URI, which would be something like wikipedia.org slash shell or company.com slash shell. So it's this idea that each entity in that data has its own URI where further data about that entity is stored. And that's again the idea of linking. You're linking between these different URIs. And even a relationship is part of that linking. Now, all of this linking creates what's sometimes called the semantic web. This is the idea of the, the part of a web that is um, created through the use of linked data. And probably the best example of this is what's called um, the knowledge graph and, and in particular Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha was a, um, a computational knowledge engine. It, it basically worked like a search engine and people used it like a search engine. But the idea was that you were asking questions of a massive set of linked data sets. You could type into Wolfram Alpha something like um, you know, what is the capital of um, London or how old is Theresa May? So if I try that, so how old is, I shall try how old is Boris Johnson? No, I'll try Donald Trump. There we go. What it's doing at this point is it's trying to identify the entities involved and it's trying to identify the properties that I'm asking about in the question. So it's identified Donald Trump as a particular politician. It's um, related it to, it's fetched a property of that um, person. So for example, their birth date, it's fetched the property of today, and then it's calculated a result. And Wolfram Alpha was really the first project that made this idea of linked data um, mainstream and usable. And it's used what's often called the knowledge graph. The knowledge graph is this idea of a graph of linked pieces of information. So we've seen one example with Bob living in York. This is a slightly more complex example where we have um, a cafe which is located in a city, which is a subregion of a, another area, which is a subregion of the USA. And there's company relationships and other locations and so on. And you can see again these uh, these orange dotted lines are the inferred facts. So this is information which is not stored in the data but can be inferred from it. So we can infer that Big Books Cafe is located in the USA because we know that it's located in Seattle and so on. And this is the knowledge graph, this, this network of connected facts. And you'll see this on Google whenever you search for any sort of entity that features in that knowledge graph. If you type into Google, how tall is Tom Cruise, it won't just give you a link to a web page which features those words. It will actually try to answer that question by identifying that Tom Cruise is a person and it will identify which Tom Cruise it thinks you are more likely to be referring to. And it already has information in its own linked data store in its knowledge graph about his height. So it provides that to you. It also provides lots of other information. So on the right hand side, you can see essentially the knowledge graph that Google has about Tom Cruise, a short biography, a birth date, a birthplace, the height, spouses, movies, children, social media profiles. It's also bringing up other actors and their heights, anticipating that because people who've searched for this may perhaps have searched for these heights as well, Maybe that's why it's presenting those people as well. It's already anticipating your next question. Facebook also has a knowledge graph. It's called the open graph. Um, if you phrase a search query on Facebook in a particular way, it will understand the relationships you're trying to identify. So if you search for pages liked by people who live in Birmingham, the areas that are um, highlighted in red for are these relationships and then we've got the entities around those as well. So again, it's using your search to try to understand relationships in its own open graph. So now we come on to the recent um, big idea, big data, and exploring that. that. One of the things with big data for data journalists is that um, we're dealing with data sets that 
are increasingly maybe too big for us to deal with in a standard piece of software like Excel. And we shouldn't be in that story. We shouldn't be turning stories down because they're too big. This is one story which I've mentioned previously, um, which fell into this category. The data involved here was huge. It was 37 million rows. I think I, I gave a smaller size when I talked about it previously, and over 2,400 CSVs from data.police.uk. So this obviously presented a problem. It's too big to deal with in Excel, um, too big even to deal with in tools like RStudio. So in this case, I turned to a tool called BigQuery. This is a big data tool created by Google, um, which is open to use. You do get some credit, uh, or at least you did when I used it, um, so you could use it for free for a while, and that's essentially what, what I did. And then when your credit runs out, you then have to pay small amounts of money each time to make a, a query of your large data set. And it is incredibly powerful. It uh, ran queries in seconds, which would take an hour on my machine. And you can see at the bottom the, an example of the sorts of query that I ran on BigQuery against my, um, whatever it was, 37 million row data set. Uh, and this is using a language called SQL, which I'm going to talk about in a different video. But BigQuery is one of the tools that as data journalists we might have to get to grips with if we're dealing with big data. But also, we need to deal with contested definitions of what big data is. If you look into definitions of big data, you'll often come across the terms volume, velocity and variety, possibly value as well. And the idea that big data basically has a lot of those things. But that doesn't help us identify how much volume makes something big data. In fact, Lewis and Westland go as far as to say that big data is a bit of a mythology. It's similar to the idea of Web 2.0. Um, a decade or so ago that was essentially a bit of marketing speak. But Web 2.0 did have an important cultural meaning distinguishing a particular period of practice from an earlier one. And big data is a useful term to think about in terms of, for example, the, the fact that many data sets are beyond the ability of typical tools to work with. Now, the problem with that is that it's a moving definition. It's it, the, the tools get better, so something that was big data a few years ago might not be big data now. But I think that idea is, is still quite useful in terms of identifying what we mean when we talk about big data. Boyd and Crawford, on the other hand, say that the idea of big data is less about the size of it than about the capacity that we have to search, aggregate and cross-reference large data sets and that's um, quite a good point to make because the that capacity raises a number of challenges and opportunities for us as journalists and for the subjects um, of our reporting, the organisations that are generating and, and analysing big data itself. For example, one problem to be aware of when dealing with big data is what's called the multiple comparison story. This is the idea that the more data you have, the more likely it is that you can make any comparison between two of those variables and find a significant relationship or correlation. The problem with this is that it's also more likely to be coincidental. If you've got 20 variables and you find a relationship between two of those, then perhaps that is significant. But if you've got 2 million variables and you find a significant relationship, statistically significant relationship, then it is probably more likely to be coincidental. Um, but people might present these relationships, these statistically significant relationships, as a important finding, when in fact it's merely coincidence. So first of all, as journalists, we need to be skeptical when those claims are made, particularly by organisations dealing with large data sets. Um, but also we need to be wary of making those ourselves. Now in terms of our own practice, large data, um, big data sets, provide a different way to start to find story leads. Um, and there's been some research on this approach, this distinction between the traditional approach to stories, which is hypothesis driven. We come up with a hypothesis, we find the data to test it, and then we see if our hypothesis stands up. 
And a new approach, which is a data-driven path. This is the idea that instead of starting with a hypothesis, we start with the data we, and we look for interesting relationships, outliers. We let those surface in a way that leads us in directions we might not otherwise have looked in. Now, this is useful in challenging our journalistic habits in, in opening up different storylines that we might not otherwise have thought about, particularly if there's a lack of diverse thinking within the team. But of course, we run into the similar sort of multiple comparisons problem, particularly if we're talking about some sort of correlation or relationship. So we need to be cautious in how we pursue that and make sure that, that we're not relying on the data alone to, um, to lead us to a correlation or relationship. So just to sum up some of those key points. The first is that a lot of these terms are contested and when you're dealing with open data in particular, um, remember it's not always open, it's not always accurate and it's not always the most important data set you could be dealing with. So look beyond the open data, hold it to account, open up data yourself to broaden the range that's available to others. Secondly, consider that distinction between a hypothesis-driven approach to data journalism and a data-driven approach where um, you're, you start with the outliers of the relationships and go from there. And finally, watch out for the multiple comparisons problem when dealing with big data, whether that's dealing with it yourself or being presented with some apparent significant relationship by an organisation that deals with it. You can find more on this subject in this week's reading, which is um, from Computer Assisted to Data-Driven Journalism and Big Data by Philip Hammond.